sharks have fascinated mankind and held it in awe for centuries. However, most people only know the few species that sometimes come in contact with humans. Most of the living species of sharks on the planet live in the deep sea. Of the, say, 500 species of sharks living that we know of now, between 55 and 60 percent of them live their whole lives deeper than 700 feet deep. It's a totally, totally different environment. The information that we have for a lot of these deep water species has been restricted historically to a handful of specimens that exist in museums. If you compare what we know about deep sea sharks to these coastal species, we're years behind them and we're still playing catch up. These rarely seen animals range from the very large and prehistoric looking blunt nosed six gill shark. They're just so cool. These sharks have these big, shiny, emerald colored eyes. They're just gorgeous. To the small and bioluminescent green lantern shark. It's such a cool little dude. Until now, Relatively little research has been conducted on the sharks of the deep, leaving many questions unanswered. That's the last domain of shark research. It's just wide open. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving. The following program contains graphic content which may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. On a sunny day in October, a team of scientists is busy loading up the RV Weatherbird for a 10-day research cruise. Their destination, the northern Gulf of Mexico. The goal, to find out if the BP oil spill has impacted the bottom-dwelling sharks and other fishes in the deep sea. One of the real unfortunate parts about the Deepwater Horizon blowout was that uh, after it happened, everybody said, well, all right, this thing occurred at, at a mile deep. Well, what ecosystems are being affected? And for the most part, we had to say we don't know because so little of it had been studied. I think the primary reason that this work hasn't been done before is just the expense. It's logistically difficult to work in the deep sea, especially with big animals. In April of 2010, the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon rig set off the largest accidental marine oil spill in the history of the petroleum industry. Over the course of nearly three months, roughly 4.9 million barrels of crude oil gushed out of the well and into the Gulf of Mexico. Never before, had an oil spill occurred at such depth, leaving many to ponder the long-term impacts of the spill. To better understand what fishes live in the deep waters of the northern gulf and how they may have been impacted, Dr. Dean Grubbs, together with a team of scientists, began regular research trips shortly after the spill. To capture a variety of animals, the scientists use a combination of traps and long lines. 
We're setting out a long line that's designed to basically allow us to pinpoint habitats at different depths. So we've got five different hook sizes. And that allows us to catch relatively small fishes all the way up to 15, 16 foot sharks, sometimes on the same line. And then in, we also have interspersed along here three different types of traps. And the idea of the traps is they'll catch some fish that won't get caught on the hooks. So they'll also catch some of the invertebrates that we want that are lower down on the food chain. Let's stay out there for about four or five hours and we'll come back and haul it. So we're going to set three of these back to back, one from shallower to deeper. So we've set the third one. We'll return to the first one and pick it up. The experts begin their work on the eastern slope of the continental shelf in an area that is thought to be less impacted by the oil. From here, they will slowly work their way southwest into the deeper waters of the DeSoto Canyon. The DeSoto Canyon is an erosional valley that cuts through the broad continental shelf in the northern part of the Gulf. The oil spill occurred in the southwest portion of the canyon. And of course the current and the wind took the oil north into the Louisiana, Mississippi region and everything. And so basically it blew it right up the DeSoto Canyon. After a few hours, it's time for the scientists to start hauling the lines and traps back onto the boat. And it doesn't take long before they have a nearly 15-foot blunt-nosed six-gill shark on the line. No matter what book you look in, they'll tell you it's a rare large deep water shark. Well, everywhere I've gone and tried to catch them, I've caught them. I don't think they're that rare. They seem to be quite common worldwide in tropical to subtropical oceans at 200 to maybe 1,000 meters deep. They're definitely exciting. They're the biggest sharks we catch. We've caught probably a dozen or more that are over 15 feet long in the Gulf of Mexico, up to 17 feet long. They only have one dorsal fin, and their jaw structure is a little different than some of the other sharks. Huge saw blade-like teeth. If you look for a tooth that resembles a living shark species in the fossil record from 200 million years ago, it looks just like the six gills from today. And so that shark that we're looking at on the deck of the boat likely looks exactly like the shark that was swimming around 200 million years ago, before most of the dinosaurs were on the scene. So the first one I caught, to me, you know, that's as if I just pulled up a T-Rex, a brontosaurus or something. After taking some basic measurements and a tissue sample, the shark is tagged P and let go. Early on, the experts also catch a lot of other fish, including a small shark species known as the Cuban dogfish. While the scientists do release large sharks like the sixgill, most of the other fish can't be let go. It would be great if all of our research, we could just tag and release everything and get all the information we needed from that. Unfortunately, that's not the way it is. Since so little is known about the life histories of many of these fishes and how they may have been impacted by the oil spill, scientists need to collect and dissect specimens. These are the dorsal fin spines from this uh, Cuban dogfish, Squalus cubensis. This is the first dorsal spine, this is the second. Most people probably don't realize that some sharks have spines on their dorsal fins. Most sharks don't. The shark species that have spines in front of their fins record growth bands on these spines, similar to the growth rings on a tree. Counting these bands allows scientists to age the animals. The age information is important for determining the maximum age of the species and also determining age at maturity. Um, this is important in a management context. We need to know what age they are when they first start reproducing and also for population level estimates. At some of the study sites, the animals come up ravaged by isopods, scavengers, 
that attack dead and dying animals in the sea. They make quick work of a carcass. If it's a bony fish, there'll be nothing but a skeleton left if you leave it down there too long. And if it's a shark, a lot of times it'll be just an empty skin sack with no tissue, no meat, no muscle left. Very efficient. As the scientists move their lines and traps into deeper water, the species they catch start to change. So that's what we're calling Squalus mitsuclurii, and it's really similar to the little Cuban dogfish, Squalus cubensis, we were catching earlier in the trip. These two types of sharks, as well as certain bony fishes, are among the primary species for the oil spill-related studies. They make for good sentinels because they are caught in large quantities and in areas that are thought to be more or less affected by the spill. That's one of the two species of hakes we get that are really common. There's a, a shallow water hake, Europhysis floridana, that we get predominantly between 200 and about 400 meters or so, and then about 400 meters we start getting Europhysis serrata. And so those are two of our sentinel species that we're using sort of to look for spatially and, and uh, depth-mediated differences in exposure to oil and, and uh, mercury and all those kinds of things. To study the potential impacts of the oil, the scientists analyze the animals for signs of exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. PAHs are not only some of the most toxic components of oil, but they also take a long time to break down. So this is Europhysis serrata. We're gonna take a couple different samples on it. First is gonna be blood. We're looking at the effects of the oil spill or any toxicity in general. So now I'm gonna go after the bile and liver. We're using those again for metabolites of toxins. So that was the liver there, this large pink. And associated with the liver is the gallbladder, which is usually, in this fish, it's kind of bulbous. It's almost always green or brown. And it has almost a neon green tint to it, the bile within the gallbladder does. And it's time and light sensitive, so we try to get it as quickly as possible and put it in a light sensitive container, and then it goes immediately on ice. Then it goes for the rest of its processing. All the toxicology samples taken from the animals are worked up in a lab at the University of North Florida. Looking to see if one, is there evidence that the PAHs have been taken up in the food chain of these animals? Then second, are they just getting sequestered in the liver and disappearing or are they actually being metabolized? And then if they are being metabolized, the next step is to start looking at sublethal effects, chromosome damage, things like that from the PAHs. What we've seen so far is that, yes, the closer you get to the oil spill site, um, the higher the um, rate of occurrence of, of, of these PAHs. We also see increases in rates of metabolism as you get closer to the site. And there's also some real preliminary evidence that the deeper you go into Soto Canyon, the higher the prevalence of exposure to these PAHs. But even so far, with the ones that the University of North Florida folks have analyzed to date, the levels of metabolism still seem pretty low. They're not at a level that is shocking for most of these taxa. And so it's hard to draw too many conclusions at this point about what the overall effect of this exposure will be. You also have to understand that with these deep sea fishes, their metabolism is so slow anyway, so it'll take some time to see if this cycles through the food web and see if there are any kind of sublethal effects on reproductive success or any of those kinds of things. Brenda just passed me a Europhysis serrata, so it's my turn to take samples from it. I'll take a fin clip to look at the animal's DNA. We try to take as many samples from every animal that we catch as possible, including taking samples for researchers at other institutions. At times, there are you know are 30 different samples that will get collected from one animal. You know, uh, so we are trying to make the most use out of sacrificing these animals. So next, I'll take a sample of white muscle for mercury analysis. In addition to containing trace amounts of mercury in the oil, 
Oil spills may create an environment that is conducive to the transformation of mercury into a more toxic form that is easily absorbed by animals. This monomethyl mercury bioaccumulates up the food chain and is highly toxic. Just going to cut a little piece off of this mercury sample to put in a vial for stable isotope analysis. The stable isotopes tell us where in the food web the animal's feeding. Collecting this information gives scientists a better picture of the overall food web and whether or not the oil spill may have changed it. This oil spill related research is conducted as part of a larger effort by the Deep Sea Consortium. We were interested in connectivity uh, between the coastal area uh, and, the, and the deep sea. But in order to really understand that, we have to uh, connect all of these different disciplines in a, in a really, truly integrated way. We have a slew of people involved from geomorphologists to physical oceanographers, chemical oceanographers. Our group is a fisheries ecology group and then modelers and so forth. Once we started getting going and people started talking to each other, all of a sudden they started finding natural connections between the different groups. And that's what we're after, is that integrating all the pieces of the puzzle. From the oil spill perspective, it's the things that are well known that are, the, that are most important because they're the things that we can get plenty of samples of in order to be able to say quantitatively whether there was an effect of, of oil on these tax or not. But from my scientific interests in the deep sea, it's the rare things that really get you excited. And there is no shortage of amazing critters coming up on deck. So this is Celiorhinus redifer. It's a chain cat shark. Absolutely beautiful, just fantastic. Caught them in a trap. They do pretty well in captivity, so we're keeping them in this tank and hopefully we'll be able to take them back alive. While some animals are beautiful, others are rather creepy. Hagfish intrigue me because that's still one of the uh, kind of a holy grail of ichthyology is that we still don't know much about the ecology and biology of hagfish. Most people don't want to work on them because they're nasty. I mean, they're slimy. I mean, that's what hagfish are known for. They seem to produce more slime than their body weight. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Along with the hagfish, another otherworldly creature gets caught in the traps at depths below 500 meters. Giant isopods are awesome. They're such a cool critter. I mean, isopods, by and large, worldwide, don't get bigger than this. I mean, you know, most, most people's, the isopod most people are most familiar with are the pill bugs, the roly polies you find in your garden or in your yard. I mean, this is like a roly poly that gets this big, you know, and, and eats everything that comes down and around it, you know, is uh, terrifying to think about it if you were down there. I mean, I can just see them just all crawling across the bottom after you. They're really cool. Yeah, look like a stormtrooper from Star Wars if you look at them head on. We're not even catching the biggest ones. I can imagine the big ones are just outside of our traps trying to get in, but they can't fit through the door. And it's not just the isopods that get larger at depth. The giant snake eel, it's the biggest of the snake eels. They get, you know, well over six, seven feet long. The crazy thing about them is that they actually were just described in the 1980s. Such a cool, cool creature. I mean, most snake eels are only this big and you know, that big around. These things get enormous. They're feisty, they're tough. Snake eels are typically burrowers. I'd love to see what it looks like on the bottom where they are. I mean, it's, it's terrifying to think about. I mean, they must be just these big, giant snake eel heads sticking out of the mud. I mean, it's, they're definitely the things of a, of a horror movie, you know. To make the most of their limited time at sea, the scientists work around the clock. At $10,000 a day almost, I want to work 24 hours a day. I don't want that ship sitting doing nothing at all. And so they bring two captains on board so that they shift in and out and can keep running around the clock. And of course, for us to get sleep, we have to do the same thing. The way we get people sleep is that we divide the science crew into two teams 
for setting all of our gear. And so one team will set all of the gear and the other team will sleep. And then when it comes time to haul that gear, everybody gets up and hauls together. The processing of the animals we catch is so labor intensive, it requires everybody we have on board. And then when we're done hauling that gear, the next team will set and the previous team will get to sleep. This means that at times, scientists work up to 28 hours straight before they get a few hours of sleep. I think that ability to work round the clock and on little sleep has a lot to do with what I like to call pent-up research aggression, which is we spend so much time locked in our offices, reading papers, working on the computer, and when we get a chance to come out here and do this stuff, we just go hog wild as, as far and as fast as we can. This deep water work is exciting. You don't know what's going to come up, so that keeps the adrenaline going. One animal few people have ever seen is a tiny bioluminescent shark that was caught in a trap. So this is Epmopterus virens, it's a, the green lantern shark. It's one of the smallest species of sharks there is, period. Beautiful little creature. It's probably the most beautiful shark I've ever caught. They're called a lantern shark because their whole belly is covered in photophores. It actually produces light. The point of the light is essentially to obliterate their silhouette. They seem to exist between 300 and 1200 meters deep. And there's not much light, but there is some. We commonly refer to the area as the twilight zone. Another shark species the scientists frequently catch in deeper waters is the gulper shark. Really cool sharks, big green eyes, slimy though, really slimy, slimy sharks. The gulper shark, as well as its cousin Squalus mitsicurii, which the scientists caught in slightly shallower water, is poorly defined taxonomically. Because the deep sea environment is relatively constant worldwide. You have a lot of species that have worldwide distributions, but because they look pretty similar, they've all been called one species. But often when you start looking at these things closer, you find that they're species complexes. It wouldn't surprise me if within the next, you know, five years, Squalus mitsicurii wasn't divided into seven species in different regions. With these animals in hand, we can actually photograph them, look for morphological characters that differentiate them, and take genetic samples to see if they're the same species or not. And by and large, we found that they aren't. Same thing with the gulper sharks. The gulper sharks are a taxonomic mess worldwide, and a lot of the tax, especially the sharks, the bigger fishes, fall into that category. And there are new things out there, too. I mean, we caught a skate on one of our previous cruises that appears to be a new species. This is a big animal. It looks completely different than anything else, and it's gone undetected for so long. In addition to studying how old they get, the scientists are also interested in learning more about the reproductive processes of deep sea sharks. Shark species use several different modes of reproduction. While some are egg layers, others give birth to live pups. We've got a gulper shark here. They only have one offspring per pregnancy. That's very low for fishes. Even among sharks, that's fairly low. So we don't know what their gestation period is. Uh, it's likely to be pretty long. A cousin of the gulper shark has a two-year gestation. So if, if, if these guys are comparable, and that's a big if, they may only have one pup every two years. Extrapolate that over the life and you'll you know, quickly realize the ability of each female to contribute to the population is limited. Looks a lot like the mom. This is where the yolk sac is attached. And that's the, that's the rest of the yolk that will carry this thing on for the rest of embryonic development. Knowing how old the animals can get, at what age they start to reproduce, and how many offspring they may have, allows scientists to inform life history models for the animals. This information is an important tool for fisheries managers. While deep sea sharks aren't currently targeted by any fisheries in the United States, their numbers have declined in other parts of the world.
We've seen in Australia, we've seen in, in um, the Azores and Portugal and other places that where deep water fisheries have developed, either targeting deep water sharks or not targeting them but catching them as bycatch, they've quickly collapsed. Over the course of this trip, the crew deployed 53 long line and trap sets covering stations ranging from 75 to over 2,000 meters deep. They caught almost 800 fishes and invertebrates, which will add to their ever-growing database of deep sea animals in this part of the Gulf of Mexico. The information that will come out of the work is just phenomenal. They've already identified some very interesting differences in community structure that nobody knew about. And so they'll be able to get at the essence of what makes those communities so different based on the behavior of the animals. It's absolutely cutting edge. It's marvelous work. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving.